Today is your lucky day. You get to watch a video that doesn't have me droning on endlessly. I mean, I'm not even in the video. Well, I guess technically I am in the video because I'm in the beginning. But this video has Steve Brule. I interviewed Steve and talked to him about what it takes to run your first dyno test. You know, you build a motor or have somebody else build a motor and it's your first time at the dyno. You bring the motor to the dyno. What do you expect? What do you need to bring? What's going to happen? He covers it all. Oh, this thing right here? That's a 429 high compression motor, all stock. Not quite a Cobra Jet or a Super Cobra Jet, but it's close. And yeah, I want to test it really bad. But let's talk to Steve Brule and find out about dyno testing. Okay, I'm here with Steve Brule, engine dyno expert. Steve, I want to find out what happens when a guy builds his own motor and has, or has somebody else build it, and a guy that brings his engine to the dyno like for the first time. I mean, you get to see it all the time every day. It's normal for you, but a guy that's just coming for the first time, what does he need to bring to have his engine ready to dyno? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is encourage a phone call. Whether he starts with a phone call or we end with one, we're going to talk on the phone. Can't get everything we need to talk about or discuss done over an email. It just doesn't happen. So when you talk about the first engine, first time, for me, a lot of it depends on what engine it is. I mean, if it's a small block Chevy, that's almost a no-brainer. I mean, we've got... Truly, we probably have more spare parts here than any dyno shop anywhere. So if we can't get it done with a Chevrolet, then it probably can't be done. If it's something like a Ford FE or something a little more unique, a Pontiac, maybe some of the late model stuff, we're going to have a few more things to discuss. It's going to either be headers, flywheels, some of those things that we do and don't have. But like I say, a conversation will get us miles ahead. Um, part of it's the engine building process, whether it be yourself or an engine builder. You know, there's things that you want to do. You want to make sure the oil system is primed, that the engine's really ready to go. We don't care to have all the accessories and belt drive systems and all that stuff on the engine. That just actually complicates things. And we've got water pumps for most stuff. But again, it's really a conversation between myself and the builder or the owner. If a guy has a motor and it's here ready to go, what are the things it needs to go from there to being actually mounted on the dyno? Well, when you say ready to go, I'm going to assume that means a complete engine. Yes, it's a um, complete long block with either carburetor or fuel injection on it. It won't have the exhaust system or headers uh, in most cases. Um, it's not going to have necessarily a flywheel or drive plate or any of that stuff or even a water pump. So when we set it up out on the cherry picker ready to roll it in and mount on the dyno, we're going to put a flywheel on. Not a flex plate, but a flywheel because the way the Superflow dyno works, it's actually got an input shaft and a bell housing, kind of like a standard transmission. So the the standard transmission flywheel and drive plate kind of act like a pressure plate and clutch disc, and that's what uh, drives the dyno. We want to install a water pump. You know, there's wiring, fuel lines, uh, the exhaust system, headers, collectors, kind of completing the engine. We've got a motor up on the dyno, and we've got the headers on and all that stuff on there. But let's say it's a brand new motor, it's something that's never been run and it probably needs to be broken in. What do you guys do to get the thing ready to break it in and actually start it? Well, we're kind of we're going to go over the whole engine as if we're taking it on a 60 mile trip. I mean, we're going to check oil levels, make sure that the cooling tower has water in it, uh, check the ignition wires, the firing order. I'm going to ask the customer how comfortable he was when he latched the valves. I mean, if he really doesn't know and he's not comfortable with that, I'm going to pull the valve covers off and lash them for him. If he says, no, I got it, then we're going to start it. But I'm going to have uh, Troy in the cell as well when I started out here with a stethoscope and a timing light, and he's going to take a look at those basic things very quickly. We just want to get it running. There's a couple of different things, and camshafts seem to be the most critical for break-in. A flat tappet is the toughest because that engine has to start and start immediately. The valve train has to be adjusted. We want to immediately get the engine up to a couple thousand RPM because what happens, it's kind of cool if you can actually have a Lexan pan or something you could see inside the engine. The oil actually fans from cylinder to cylinder on passenger side, driver side, and swings across the camshaft. So it's lubricating the whole inside of the engine, lubricating the cylinder walls as well as the camshaft. Not quite so critical on roller motors. Hydraulic rollers, if they're adjusted properly, it's almost a no-brainer. You start it, you can warm it up. On a solid lifter camshaft, roller or flat tap it, I'm going to warm the engine and then shut it back off within probably two or three minutes. Just get it up to temperature, go out and lash the valves because there's a lot of things that initially take place. Um, those are really the most important things and we want, it, we want it to basically run smooth immediately. So once it's got some temperature, I don't want to rev the engine up to time it and have full swing in the distributor or anything. I'm just going to rev, just warm it up, 
so the engine's running smooth. And then once it's warmed up, then I'm gonna bring the RPM up, assuming everything still sounds okay, and we've listened to it and walked around it. We actually go into the cell with a heat gun, a flashlight, a stethoscope and a timing light. And so you kind of walk around like it's your patient, you know, I mean, you're kind of babysitting it and making sure that the health of the whole engine is good. There's no big oil leaks. There's no, there's no real problems. And so once that part of it is established and the engine seems to be okay, then we're gonna check the timing. Uh, and then I'm gonna start a break-in process. And what that does again is that fanning of the oil back and forth. And we'll do that for 10 or 15 minutes. Let it idle, go out, do a reinspection on the engine, kind of a pre-dyno test inspection. I'm gonna relash the valves, recheck them. And then we'll uh, run it through another break-in cycle. And then what I do when I start testing is doing some very short transient tests. I don't just go from 3,000 to 6,000. I start and I will go from 3,000 maybe to, depending on the style of the engine, from 3,000 to 4,000. If it's a race style engine, it might be 7,000 to 8,000 the first little pulse. So there's some differences there in acceleration rate and kind of the way that you treat the engine. I'll start with one of the things I failed to mention was priming the oil system. Yeah. And, and it changes a little bit with different engines. What I'll do with a lot of traditional V8s that have an oil pump and a distributor is I'll ask the customer to do that if they're capable prior to getting here because there's nothing more frustrating than getting an engine all the way up on the dyno. It's mounted, it's hooked up, we've got headers on it, we go to prime the oil system and it was a dry sump block and fills up the valley and doesn't return anything. I've had it happen. Uh, some of the other things that'll happen is Sometimes lifters don't allow oil to get to the top end of the engine. So we want to have the customer engine builder try that first. Okay, Steve, we've seen the, you know, using the drill, spin the drive shaft pump yeah. or to, to spin the oil pump on a traditional small block. But what about stuff like an LS that has a gyro pump? Well, on that, because they don't have a distributor and they don't have an oil pump that's accessible to get to with a drill motor or a shaft. What we do with the LS's, which are a little different, is we take all the spark plugs out, make sure those are out. Hopefully the pump has been pre-lubed because that really helps it pick up oil. But we actually take all the spark plugs out and we've got a little trick that we use here because we've already tried all the widgets and gadgets and electric motors and pumps and pressure and all that. What we do is we put about two PSI of crankcase pressure in the crankcase, which adds a little head pressure to the oil pump pickup. So everything's sealed then, right? Yeah, and, and we start cranking it. We hold, you know, there might be a little breather and we put our thumbs over at that. And like I say, just a pound or two of pressure. And when we spin the engine with no spark plugs in it, it will pick up oil pressure in the first five or 10 seconds. It's pretty amazing how effective it is. Okay, Steve, we've got the motor up on the dyno. We've got it pre-lubed. We've even got it broken in. So now you have to worry about tuning it to try to get the most power out of the can and find out what the motor can do. So what's the procedure that going from, okay, it's ready to run to actually tuning it? Okay. Well, I guess what I'm going to say first is slowly. Um, I'm pretty cautious, you know, and once it's broken, I'm going to pick an RPM number with some very conservative timing in the engine and I'm just going to roll in once and take a quick peek at air fuel ratio. It's not even going to be a run. It's just going to be a quick peek because I've seen them when they, go to 15 to 1, obviously we're not going any further until we address that issue. Kind of what I always tell customers is you can have a whole bunch wrong with an engine for a very short period of time. But if we do it for a long time, it's going to be a disaster. So I just want to take a quick peek. If that looks okay, what I really do is I start extending that transient testing to a little longer run with each run and kind of checking things back and forth, knowing that the timing is conservative. My primary concern then is looking at oil pressure and air fuel ratio. And that's actually why these two are mounted right together over here. We've got the lambda meter and the oil pressure gauge. There's one eye on those and one on the engine. <laughs> But it, uh, it's, it's really a slow process. And you know, a term I always use is I kind of babysit the engine. And that's just, you know, you're kind of watching over it, making sure that everything's healthy. Um, you know, you'll hear the right way to tune an engine with air fuel ratio is you continue to make the engine richer until it loses power and then you go back the other way. Now you know that you've hit that spot. Realistically, you know, we've got a window that we can work within. If it's a normally aspirated, V8 engine, it's going to be between 11 and a half and 13. So if I'm in that window, I know I'm not going to hurt anything at 13 and I might not see the best power at 11 and a half, but I know it's safe to run there. So I'm going to find out if that air fuel ratio is good throughout the run and I'm going to extend that. It kind of finishes the break in procedure as well because it's kind of short transient testing. Once I've got an air fuel ratio that I'm kind of okay with, then I'm going to start looking at timing. 
and then I'll go back to air fuel ratio and then I'll go back to timing and really what it amounts to is the engine's telling me stuff the whole time I'm looking at data the power comes up I go ooh it liked that so I think I'll do it some more I mean it's not wizardry here it's just it tells me that it liked it it made more power now having said that that's all normally aspirated engine stuff blower motors are a different story blower motors you can keep tuning them until you let the smoke out and so you do have some target numbers with blower motors and those are a little more conservative on timing on air fuel ratios and those are just to keep it safe um, most of the time the blower stuff has enough power that you're not looking for the last five or ten so you kind of look at target numbers and tuning them a little differently okay see we're gonna finish up here we've got our motor on we've we've broken it in we've tuned it and now it's working really well but Obviously, every combination isn't the same. So I, we want to talk to, <laughs> to you because you're the carb whisperer. So when you're tuning a carbureted application, what is a really difficult carbureted application for most guys to tune, and how do you go about it? Well, the first thing I'll say is that there's guys a whole lot smarter than I am about carburetors. I just have a whole bunch of data here. And when there's five or six circuits in a carburetor that I can go to, I mean, you just kind of have to know what you want to contour. So I guess if it's a drag race only car, I'm not too worried about part throttle drivability. I mean, that's just getting it back to the pits. But a lot of what we do here is marine engines and street cars and big inch things, you know, 560 and 70 inch engines that need to drive as well as make the same power wide open. So we're fortunate to have data here. What I can do, for example, on a single four barrel with a dominator is I can look at primary and secondary fuel flow. So as well as having left to right in the engine being rich or lean, you can also have something that looks like an average number that's okay, but the front of the engine could be really lean and the back of the engine could be really rich. So I'm looking at front and rear as well. But now the trick is, is to have that okay at wide open and still make it drive okay. One of the things I do with the later model dominators is they come with somewhere around a 92 jet in them typically. I will sometimes peel 12 or 14 jets out of the primary because they'll cruise in the high nines or tens because it was designed as a race carburetor. But then I will also enrich the power valve enrichment passage from somewhere in the 70s, early 70s, to over a hundred thousandths in diameter and change the power valve to a 10.5. So now I've got this air fuel ratio with an 80 jet in it instead of a 92. It's cruising along in the high 11s or 12s, which is much more reasonable. But then that transition period, when you roll in, the power valve opens up, it enriches that primary side so it matches the secondary side. We have the same flow and power as we had wide open when we were done tuning it kind of square as a race carburetor, but now we've turned it into a street carburetor. And the, real, the reality of it is, is you know, dominators aren't just race carburetors anymore in my mind. You've got, you know, 550 inch up engines running around with one carburetor on the street, on the river, at the lake, wherever, and so you've got to make them drivable. Nice, Steve. Thanks, man. Okay, guys, what do you think about uh, our interview with Dino Brule? The guy's awesome. I mean, he's the real deal. He's the Dino guy, Dino Brule. He's the go-to guy. He's the car whisperer. Whenever we have questions, we go to him, and he's there on the front line. He's making it happen. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for helping out. This motor, 429, high compression, you know, early model. Not a Cobra Jet or Super Cobra Jet, but right below that. I think it's rated at like 360 or 370 horsepower right in there. And it's all stock, which is awesome, and it's a runner. So I'd like to run it stock and do a bunch of stuff with it. And it's owned by my buddy, Mark Sanchez, who lets me stay with him when I come down here to Dino Test. So let's take a look. The other thing I'm doing today, let's take a walk over here. We got our Buick 455. I'm trying to get this thing ready to run as soon as there's dyno time available. I've also got the Cadillac here. We all we already know the tales of woe there. That thing's not working. It's broke. But I'm going to go out and visit Courtney, and I'm going to do a bunch of Cadillac testing with him because he's got all the stuff there. I mean, he's the Cadillac man. Thanks for watching, guys. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. Buick.